Early in the 16th century, Africa began to suffer the greatest calamity in its history, the steady and continuous arrival of Europeans. This was one of 43 castles built by seven European nations along the coast of West Africa. They stand today as monuments to rivalry and greed. For the Europeans had discovered the wealth of the Americas, mining wealth and plantation wealth, and the way to get it by using slave labor. Unwilling to take slaves from Europe and unable to find enough in the New World, they turned to Africa. Horrible in its brutality and violence, the slave trade robbed Africa of millions of men and women and even children. It spread cruelty and disaster. And yet, it was not only the enormous numbers that mattered. Every year for centuries, the trade removed from Africa tens of thousands of productive workers of skilled workers, of men and women trained in tropical farming, in valuable crafts, and in many forms of enterprise. Today, the great Atlantic rollers have long lost their menace, and the forebears of these boys were among the lucky ones. But for millions before them, perhaps as many as 15 millions, this was the last they would ever see of their African homeland. Among the ship's captains, there were tight packers and loose packers. Their purpose was the same, to enlarge their profits by landing as many slaves as possible alive in the new world. Sometimes captured far inland, the victims of black traders were driven to the dungeons of their white partners on the coast. There were protests, but they dwindled as the profits of the trade became ever more corrupting to kings and merchants in Africa as well as in Europe. It became normal and even necessary for white people to think of their black victims as less than human. Racism grew out of slavery. At Cape Coast, a chapel was built for the British garrison right on top of the dungeons where, at any one time, up to 1,500 black captives awaited shipment. Not even the clergy spoke out against the trade, and some were ready to share in the pickings. Early in the 19th century, the Atlantic slave trade gradually began to come to an end. But even as the slavers withdrew, Europeans of a new kind began to penetrate deeply into the interior. These were the explorers. They had no warlike intentions, and the guns they carried were for hunting and self-defense. It was seldom the fault of such men that the routes they opened up would all too soon be used by others with very different aims. Later generations of explorers would try for the North Pole or the South or in our own day, the Moon. But for Mungo Park, Livingston, Burton and many others, Africa's legendary lakes and rivers were the great challenge. Above all else, they wanted to unlock the geographical mysteries of the continent. The strange thing about those remarkable men is that they really were only interested, with a few exceptions, in finding things, in gold, in ivory, in geographical information, in land to take. Almost never were they really interested in the humanity of Africa. The great exception was David Livingstone. For the inhabitants of Central Africa, surely the best loved European ever to set foot in their country. A missionary who became an explorer, Livingston traced the great Zambezi River from its far inland source to the Indian Ocean, hoping that if he could only prove it to be a navigable waterway, the whole of Central Africa could be opened up to the blessings of the gospel. 
In 1855, he became the first white man to see the Victoria Falls, soon to be accepted as one of the natural wonders of the world. But less dramatic obstacles further downstream barred the way to navigation. His specially constructed river steamer had to turn back. Today, Livingston's statue stands overlooking the falls to which he gave a name. The inscription says that Dr. David Livingston discovered the falls. That was in 1855. What happened, in fact, was that African friends of his, with whom he was living some days upstream from here, told him about this amazing sight in their country and brought him to see it. And Livingston, whose generosity of heart never allowed him to forget what he owed to Africans, was careful to record this in his memoirs. But the people who put the statue up long after evidently thought that nothing really exists until a white man has found it. But news of such earthly wonders failed to impress his missionary paymasters in London. To them, Livingston's journeys and geographical researches were a sign that he was neglecting his work for God. They wanted converts, not waterfalls. He, for his part, found their attitude to the splendors of Africa so narrow that he was driven to resign his membership of the London Missionary Society. His duty, he believed, was to respond to a wider vision. There were plenty of others to do ordinary work, and so indeed there were. A growing band of dedicated men and women came forward from many nations to carry the gospel into these heathen lands. This is the Mangwe Pass, an historic place in the story of the white man's penetration of southern Africa. To the southwest lay the deserts of the Kalahari, and beyond to the southeast, white ruled South Africa. While back behind me, through the hills, the old trail ran north to Bulawayo, capital of the kingdom of the Matabele. Here ran the southern frontier of that kingdom, and this pass was the only point of entry allowed by the Matabele king to European missionaries, traders, or hunters. In their attitude to the Africans whom they'd come to convert, most of the missionaries would have been happy to echo the words of Livingston himself. We come among them as members of a superior race and servants of a government that desires to elevate the more degraded portions of the human family. We are adherents of a benign, holy religion and may, by consistent conduct and wise, patient efforts, become the harbingers of peace to a hitherto distracted and downtrodden race. A few thought otherwise. Here are the words of Bishop Tozer of the university's mission. What do we mean when we say that England or France are civilized countries and the greater part of Africa is uncivilized? Surely the mere enjoyment of such things as railways and telegraphs do not necessarily prove their possessors to be in the first rank of civilized nations. Nothing can be so false as to suppose that the outward circumstance of a people is the measure either of its barbarism or its civilization. Nevertheless, most missionaries believed that they alone could raise Africans out of their spiritual degradation. They faced many perils, not from being boiled in an African pot, which never happened, but from mortal fevers they could not cure. Six out of nine at Makalolo Mission, which Livingston had founded, died in a single year. Willing converts were few. 
So it had to be asked, is force justified to save a man's soul? Flogging was used at some mission stations, others disapproved. If it is agreed that an expedition cannot be carried out unless the leader of it commits day-by-day -day acts of brute violence, the reply is that missionary expeditions had better not be undertaken. If missions can only be worked by methods which no supporter of the mission would dare to state in detail on a mission platform, then missions had better not be undertaken. But another and unquestioned requirement lay at the core of missionary labors. If the gospel message was to be accepted, the spiritual beliefs which formed the foundation of African community life had to be drained of their power and effectively destroyed. What the missionaries had come to do was to convince Africans that they must renounce their beliefs, forget their ancestors, and discard the very fabric of their culture. This missionary film, made as recently as the 1960s, makes the point very clearly. As these women, whose lives have been spent in the dark shadow of fear, listen to the radiant young girls, they wonder at their joy and confidence. They remember the offerings they've so often made to the juju themselves, the sacrifices which have been of no use. I will tell you of a God who does not require our sacrifice. He made sacrifice for us. And she shows to these fear-ridden people the symbol of God's love. Sometimes the people seek out the missionary later. We have lost our faith in these jujus, they say. We want to destroy them and begin a new life. Some rejoice. Some wonder what will become of them now. Finally comes the great day when they gather for the baptism service. Students from the training college, girls from the primary school, men and women, one by one they go down into the waters of baptism so that they might be renewed in Christ. A skeptic might find it hard to see why one form of spiritual renewal should be so superior to another. But to these missionaries, this was the indispensable climax to their endeavors. This is a Methodist school called Wadilav in modern Zimbabwe. It's an important day because the Minister of Information, Mr. Nathan Shamurira, himself an old boy of the school, is making a visit. The event brings into focus some of the underlying currents and contradictions of recent history. 
Mr. Chamuriera speaks for a government with radical ideas which may well find itself at odds with religious conservatism. Yet he was educated here and brought up in the religion of white colonial settlers whose contempt for African humanity generally outweighed their Christian commitment to the brotherhood of man. It's one of the ironies of Christianity in Africa that, although it may have preceded colonial occupation, it can't now escape from the fact that it became deeply involved with the system. The foreign rulers may have departed, yet the tunes live on. Unechimiro chake, chisinga tonu ene zimwe zimwe. Chisina mumwe... Nowadays, the sermon is no longer in English. This clergyman is speaking Shona, the language of most of the children at Wadilav. And he clearly feels no need to put so much emphasis on sin and guilt. <laughs> How far is the accusation true that missionary teaching was really part of colonial teaching? Well, the whole missionary enterprise here was, part, was an integral part of colonization. The missionaries uh, came to this country with the colonizers from South Africa and one particular missionary, Reverend Jackson, assisted in interpreting the deceptive Rad concession to uh, King Lubengula at the time of colonization. And this uh, relationship between the administrators, the soldiers and the miners, the gun and the Bible, so to speak, continued throughout the you know, colonial period. But however, colonial, uh, the missionary enterprise did uh, also uh, assist in the sharpening of contradictions within colonial society. On the one hand, the missionaries were preaching the equality of man, and yet they themselves were practicing discrimination in a deeply racially divided colonial society. Uh, so they were part of the racist setup. They were really. part of the racist setup. On the other hand, they were providing education in order to uh, uh, get literate workers to work in the factories and in the mines and, uh, and farms of the colonizer. In honor of the minister's visit, the school has laid on a display of gymnastics. Most early missionaries tried to destroy the dancing arts and rhythms of Africa, saying that these were lascivious and evil. Yet African Christianity has managed to survive that effort at repression. And children at mission schools like this can have the fun of combining the new with the old. In another part of the school grounds, quite suddenly, old Africa was being revived. Here was a schoolgirl in the midst of a Christian mission reenacting the role of a spirit medium as she goes into her trance. Helped by friends, she portrays an ancient ritual of Shona belief. This, many people still believe, is the method used by their ancestors to pass messages to the living. These girls were playing out a drama of their own history, one that many of them will have witnessed in their family backgrounds. Across the years of the colonial intrusion, it's a kind of psychological reconciliation between the present and the past. Ow, 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 ow. 
how does one summarize the effect of the missionary effort in terms of Africans coming to terms, coming to grips with the realities of the world? Well, on the one hand, they uh, were, uh, you know, anxious and did, you know, take very drastic steps to uh, destroy the culture of the African people. Uh, this was implicit in the teaching of uh, Christianity itself. Uh, in the same context, it produced uh, the contradictions which led to, its, uh, to the downfall of colonialism by uh, uh, you know, educating people, bringing them to an institution like this where we were able to meet uh, uh, you know, students from different parts of the country. Uh, and one uh, was given a national perspective at an institution like this. And it was uh, uh, then possible when one left here to go and organize at a national level. So many of the national leaders of uh, this country today were educated at mission schools. Nine out of every ten educated blacks were educated at mission schools. Uh, Comrade Robert Mugabe, the first prime minister of an independent Zimbabwe, was brought up, trained, and educated at Kutama, a Roman Catholic mission school. And many of the leaders in the present Zimbabwe government were educated at various mission schools throughout the country. So it did produce its own contradictions, and it uh, you know, sharpened the contradictions in colonial society. Like a lot of other things in history, it had an unforeseen outcome. Yes, yes, it had. When you get an old boy coming to his school, certainly some of you should feel inspired by the amount of contribution that he has made and what what love has produced in him. So, sir, we are greatly honored that you have come. I know the visit has been a very brief one, but it is historical. And we do hope that when you have time, you'll be able to come back and see more of what love than you have seen today. Minister receives a hero's send-off, partly for his role as one of the leaders who fought for Zimbabwe's independence, and partly, no doubt, for being the occasion of an extra day's holiday. Watching scenes like this, it would be hard to deny that the coming of Christianity to Central Africa has, in the end, brought many blessings. These children of Zimbabwe look forward to opportunities and freedoms unknown to their parents. <laughs> Yet the cost has been a large one. Much of value in African culture was distorted or buried beneath the intolerant certainties of a foreign culture. And who can say whether, in the end, it won't be the practical benefits provided by the missions that outlast the spiritual ones?
The little town of Bagamoyo had been the African starting point for missionaries as well as explorers. For David Livingstone, it was journey's end. This is the place, ironically, a Catholic mission. The first Catholic mission on the East African mainland, where Susie and Chuma finally laid the body of their friend, David Livingstone, in its last resting place on the African continent. Throughout the final months of his life, Livingston had always been accompanied by his two devoted companions, Susie and Chuma. They it was who nursed him through his last illness and undertook that great African journey of 1,500 miles to bring his body down to the coast after he died in 1873. For that most Christian act, they were frowned out of notice and curtly dismissed. Later, happily, those faithful companions received less churlish treatment. Yet it has to be said that Livingston himself was not quite free of that same attitude. Remember his words. We come among them as members of a superior race to elevate the more degraded portions of the human family. Of course, he was a man of his time, and such attitudes were common. But he also affirmed, and this was most uncommon, that black people could be made to be equal with white people by two gifts that Europe could offer, Christianity and commerce. That's what he believed, and he died believing it. But I have wondered, in my own years of wandering these trails, what Livingston would have said if he could have seen the outcome of those two gifts. In the 1870s, the land around the little town of Kimberley, in what is now South Africa, was found to contain the richest deposits of diamonds in the world. Europeans in search of quick and easy profits rushed into the area. Among them was a young Englishman who'd come to South Africa at the age of 17. His name was Cecil Rhodes. In spite of his youth, Rhodes quickly learned that the path to great personal wealth led through great personal power. He set out to win that power by getting control of the diamond industry. He succeeded by clever manoeuvring, the steady purchase of other men's claims when their funds were low, and the necessary ruthlessness. Rhodes saw to it that he was going to be the one to emerge as the king of diamonds. And his kingdom was going to be in Africa where the English reigned supreme. This is what he wrote. Just fancy those parts of the world that are at present inhabited by the most despicable specimens of human beings. What an alteration there would be if they were brought under Anglo-Saxon influence. This early film, taken in Kimberley, shows that attitude of arrogance at work. Yet mineral wealth was not the only prize. There was territory to be won. All through the 19th century, British forces pushed out of Cape Colony, overcoming one African people after another, until in 1879, they came up against the most formidable of all, the Zulu. So far, this mission of the gun had gone well for the British. But the Zulu had 25,000 warriors ready to take up arms. Their king, Setswayo, wanted peace. After all, he'd been crowned with British approval. But the British wanted war.
This genteel set of lecture slides, the Victorian equivalent of news film from the battlefront, reported the war as the public at home wished to imagine it. This was the heyday of empire, and here were British redcoats subduing one more mob of heathen savages before bestowing on them the blessings of Anglo-Saxon civilization. The reality was very different. <laughs> At East Anshuana, Britain suffered one of the worst defeats in her imperial history, and the Zulus had a victory to celebrate. As the troops strove vainly to get the lids off their ammunition boxes, the Zulu impis overwhelmed them. At the end of the day, 800 British soldiers lay dead. Not a single wounded man was spared. But at Rourke's Drift, a few miles away, a tiny British garrison with great bravery withstood three Zulu regiments numbering nearly 5,000 men. Modern firepower took its devastating toll. <laughs> Determined to break Zulu power once and for all, another British invasion force, equipped with field artillery, and the new rapid-firing Gatling guns advanced on the king's capital at Ulundi. Here they found the Zulu army, but what followed was a massacre rather than a battle. Some 1,500 Zulu warriors died in fruitless charges on the guns. British casualties were put at 12. It was the end of the independent Zulu nation. A billionaire by this time, Rhodes now unfolded his plan for British rule from Cairo to Cape Town. His immediate ambition was fixed on the upland country to the north of the Limpopo River. Here in this broad plateau with its pleasant climate, there was abundant land for cattle and beneath it the promise of still more mineral wealth, especially gold. He faced one great obstacle. Sixty years earlier, a branch of the Zulu, known as the Matabili, had broken away, trekked north, and built a strong military kingdom in the land that Rhodes now meant to seize for white settlement. The African bush has long since moved in and taken over. But this deserted spot, a hundred years ago, was the living heart of Matabili power and the seat of government of its king. King Lobengula was only the second ruler of the Matabili. He was destined to be the last. True to their Zulu tradition, his men lived by the spear, raiding their neighbors, the Shona people, for cattle and women. This, they believed, was their land by right and title. But now, in a series of deceptions, Rhodes and his cronies proceeded to dispossess the Matabili of their land, their cattle, and their independence. One day, King Lobingula told a story to a white visitor to his court. He said to him, have you ever watched a chameleon and a fly? The chameleon gets behind the fly and gently puts one foot forward, then another, and when he's close enough, he darts his tongue and the fly disappears. I am that fly, said Lobingula, and you are the chameleon. On the outskirts of his royal kraal, Lobengula had allowed a few white missionaries to establish themselves. This is all that remains of a settlement run by Jesuits, whose celibate way of life had no appeal to the Matabili. But other missionaries, Protestants of various denominations, because, of course, the many schisms of the Christian faith were also imported with the missionaries, did begin to acquire some influence. 
but not without misunderstandings, as this old man, now well over a hundred, remembers. <laughs> Not far from the capital, across a small river, was the Anglican mission of Hope Fountain. The early missionaries were caught, almost at once, in an unavoidable dilemma. To whom was their first loyalty? To the Africans, who trusted them and whose guests they were, or to their own kith and kin? The Reverend Charles Helm, who lived in this place, made in the end a crucial choice. He was Lobangula's trusted white friend, but secretly at the same time, he began to work for Rhodes. The fact was that these missionaries soon became convinced, and no doubt rightly, and as their records show, that if they were going to convert a sizable number of Matabele, the king's power must be destroyed and Matabele culture and independence undermined. And Rhodes, they saw, was the man to do both. Step by step, Lobengula's power was eroded. He appealed to Queen Victoria. He was advised to sign treaties. Some of those who advised him to sign the treaties had come in peace and trust, but they still deceived him. The Reverend Helm lies buried here. On his tomb, his fellow missionaries felt able to inscribe the words, Friend of the Matabele. Was he their friend? Or from within the certainties of his own belief, did he connive in their betrayal? By 1890, Rhodes and his men were ready to move. These are scenes from the feature film Rhodes of Africa about the famous pioneer column. They show it in terms of the glorious legend it was to become for the white settlers who followed almost a justification in itself for their right to the land they were about to seize. Lowengula had 16,000 warriors eager to attack, but fearing defeat, he held them back. The column headed north, avoiding direct contact with the Matabele, and passing unopposed through the country of the less warlike Shona. Each man had been promised 15 gold prospecting claims and a 3,000 acre farm. A contemporary described them like this. Such a mixed lot I never saw in my life. All sorts and conditions from the aristocrat down to the street Arab. Peers and waifs of humanity mingling together like a hotchpotch. Some of the pioneers came, in fact, from the leading families of Cape Colony. If the expedition met with defeat, Rhodes knew that their influential fathers would press the British government for military assistance. An unknown photographer captured the moment when the Union Jack was raised over Fort Salisbury, fulfilling Rhodes's dream that this earth shall be English. The moment became part of the myth. Established here for no particular reason of geography, Fort Salisbury duly became the modern city of Salisbury, now renamed Harare.
Elsewhere on the continent, towns can be unmistakably African in their flavor and their style of life, but not this one. In just on 60 years, they turned it into the very model of a white man's city. And just over there is the flagstaff that commemorates the place where all that began. Amazingly enough, it's still here. For this is what it says to the pioneer corps specially recruited to become the first civil population of Mashana land. But who were more civil? The black people who had long dwelt in Mashana land and made it fruitful, or the white people who came here and took it from them by deceit and violence? Maybe that sounds a harsh question now. And yet the dispossession of the Shona was also harsh. They had settled the land centuries earlier, mastered and tamed it. And now with this, they had altogether lost their birthright. Among those who had traveled up with the pioneers was Rhodes's close friend and instrument, Dr. Starr Jameson. Rhodes now chose him to administer this newly won territory. To the southwest, there still remained the undefeated Matabili. In 1892, Jameson decided that the time had come to finish with them. A pretext was easily found. Although the Shona people were now supposed to be under white protection, they were still the target of sporadic Matabili raids. A dispute over cattle quickly produced the war that Jameson needed. In traditional style, the Matabili regiments prepared to fight for their capital, Bulawayo, against Jameson's advancing troops. No amount of Matabili courage could matter now. As an English poet wrote in bitter satire, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. After defeat came dispossession. Nearly all of Matabili farming land and most of the 250,000 Matabili cattle were confiscated by Rhodes's British South Africa Company or by individual settlers. The structure of Matabili life was shattered. The London Missionary Society wrote to congratulate Rhodes. As missionaries, we have little to bind our sympathies to the Matabili, neither can we pity the downfall of their power. Lobengula is said to have told his followers that rather than have a single bone of his body touched by a white man, he would disappear like a needle in the grass. And disappear he did, while some of his warriors tried vainly to find a new homeland northward across the Zambezi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on board our cruise, Amaz Atungayo, Cinderella word meaning the water that rises. My name is Phoebe, and Captain Sylvester is in command this evening. All drinks served on board are included in the tow prize. Before long, white settlers too began to push northward over this great waterway where a generation earlier David Livingston had wandered alone. To Rhodes would fall the unique distinction of having not one, but two African colonies bearing his name. The stage of water we are now on 
is the deepest and the narrowest part of the Zambezi. And it was here where the pioneers chose to cross as from 1889. They floated their wagons, used the light balsa wood, and swam their keko. Being so close to the river, a frighteningly large amount of the settlers became ill and often died from malaria and black water fever. Livingston had died exactly 20 years earlier, and now the way was open for Christianity and commerce. Here, in these lands where Livingston had found, as he said, perfect security for life and property, but where, for Africans, there was no longer any such thing. But African resistance was not yet over. In 1896, just three years later, surviving Matabele regiments of about 14,000 men, some now armed with rifles, rose in furious revolt. They swept down on isolated white settlements and slaughtered more than 100 farmers. Caught unprepared, the bulk of the settlers made a defensive lager at their new capital of Bulawayo. Then the Shona people, infuriated by taxation and forced labor on white farms, rose in their turn. Led by the priests of their religion, the spirit mediums Nahanda and Kagubi, they fought a stubborn guerrilla war for many months. It was not until 1897 that both risings were finally overcome. The settler forces had suffered considerable losses in the fighting. Their mood was not merciful. So-called rebels were hunted down and, when taken prisoner, treated as dangerous criminals. Chained together, they were brought before summary courts and not infrequently hanged from the nearest tree. Captured at last, Nehanda and Kagubi were also hanged. Such were the foundations on which Cecil Rhodes built his empire. Having thrust aside anyone who stood in his way, Rhodes spent little time in the country he had formed. This was the hut he used as an office. Close by, the colonial government's state house was built directly on the site of King Lobengula's old headquarters. At his death in Cape Town in 1902, Rhodes's body lay in state and was then taken to Bulawayo, where it was carried in procession through the streets. In the Matopo Hills, south of the city, Rhodes had a summer house built, where he liked to sit in the evening and watch the sun go down over that old Africa into whose history he had broken with such explosive force. Here the coffin was placed overnight before being carried up into the hills for burial. Thousands of Europeans had gathered at the spot called World's View. Rhodes had come here in the past and had chosen it as his final resting place.
So here he lies, in the heart of the country that he conquered. But are we to see this grave as the final act of taking possession, or the ultimate insult to the people he dispossessed? Rhodes has evoked conflicting judgments. For the world of wealth, he was and is the mighty empire builder, the benevolent millionaire, the hero of money. For the world of poverty, he remains a plunderer and a pirate, the robber baron who took with both hands what did not belong to him. Rhodes and his men brought material progress, and 19th century Africa certainly needed progress. But they brought it in such a way that Africans could not share in it. They deprived Africans of that very condition, freedom, that enables mankind to move forward and develop. So the great mission of the Bible and the gun ended by completely contradicting itself, by producing an African servitude in which the visions and the dreams of men such as Livingstone were bound to be denied and set at naught.